Hi, I'm Rebecca Batches. I am a board certified infection preventionist and I'm currently a senior clinical advisor for infection prevention at Diversity, which is a global company that um, makes and distributes cleaning, chemi cleaning chemicals and disinfectants. But I'm here today, I have not recorded a new YouTube video in quite some time, and I'm feeling a bit guilty. So I thought I would do a brief video in response to water intrusions and flooding in a healthcare facility and I'm going to share a checklist. I love to share documents when I provide videos like this. This video is intended for infection prevention professionals, and we have many new infection prevention and infection prevention and control professionals out there. And part of my role at Diversity is to support my fellow infection preventionists. And I've been recording educational videos from time to time on topics that I think I've experienced quite a bit or have some sort of extensive knowledge about. Um, there's not a ton of those, but I definitely think infection prevention is one of those areas for me personally. I've been working in the field of infection prevention and control for about 16 years. And I am, again, board certified and I am an uh, APIC fellow or FAPIC, just to kind of give you a little backstory of myself and why I have any authority whatsoever to talk about these topics. So I thought what I would do is go through a checklist. I'll provide the checklist link that you can access and download. You don't need to modify the document, by the way, in Google Docs. You can just download the file and then modify for your needs. I did get this. Um, template from the internet. <coughs> Excuse me. It's been a long day of talking today. Uh, the source is multi-care health system emergency response plan water intrusion. And I modified this a little bit to my own needs, but definitely want to give credit. I actually had just Googled water intrusion checks checklist. And that's how I identified the original format. So again, credit to them. Awesome checklist. I did modify this per my needs. So I'll start with the checklist and kind of go through the high level activities that we would want to ensure are occurring after a healthcare facility experiences water damage, flooding. Many different scenarios can cause water damage. Even if you live in a dry area without rain, sewers can back up. Weirdly, um, I've seen everything, especially in a healthcare facility that has an older plumbing system. I've also seen pipes just burst because one section of the pipe was old. And if that pipe bursts on the seventh floor, it's very likely that the water is going to trickle down several floors underneath it. And so you can actually have a lot of patient impact and inconvenience to your overall facilities and operations in your healthcare facility. So whether you're an outpatient or ambulatory facility or a skilled nursing facility or an acute care hospital, we should all be thinking of water intrusions in relation to infection prevention equally. They all have the potential to create what? Mold and fungi um, days after the event happens if we don't remediate things quickly. So the water intrusion flooding response checklist for healthcare providers. This is a great checklist that you can take and download and share with your facilities and, and environmental services teams and your clinical teams so that everybody's on the same page related to what they need to do if they've experienced a water intrusion of any type. Immediate response, always, 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 we need to protect our patients and each other as healthcare workers first. And of course, our property as much as possible. But the top priority, of course, is always our patients and one another's healthcare workers. Steps within this protection, we remove patients or staff in any danger who will be affected by the water, obviously. We remove them from the situation. I should take a step back and just remind you that you always want to follow your facility policies and procedures, of course. 
Interestingly, many facility policies and procedures related to water intrusion do not outline these steps as well as this healthcare system had done and posted online for all of us to see. So, of course, we want to move patients out of immediate danger. We want to move equipment and supplies as much as possible if we can protect them. And then it's a really great idea to segregate clean items from dirty items, making sure we, we label them or have some way to demarcate. Obviously, water damaged items are going to have obvious sign of damage. If patients are impacted, include patient specific details in any kind of event reporting system or incident reporting system at your facility. After you've taken care of the patients, the staff and the property, obviously the next step is going to be to control or stop the intrusion if, if you can in any way, shape or form. If the water can be turned off, do so. <clears throat> Otherwise you wanna be reaching out to your engineering facilities, maintenance department, or the contracted service, if you are in an outpatient setting, uh, there should be some person or company responsible for facilities issues, even if you're in a contracted or leased, I should say, a leased space. Electrical and other shutoffs will have to be done by engineering or facilities. <clears throat> Sometimes too, if you have a if a drip is happening from the ceiling, for example, or from a floor drain, we can do whatever we can to try to contain that. So, in the healthcare setting, we might have a large uh, garbage receptacle if we can clear that out uh, safely and try to contain as much water. But sometimes these events just happen so suddenly and so intensely that it's really hard to contain it. We might also have something coming up for the from the floor drain and if we could get something to try to uh, stop or cover the drain to at least reduce the amount of water that's coming up that might be helpful as well. We need to notify facilities they can't do any of the steps we need them to do if they don't know what's happening and this needs to happen as soon as we identify the problem. Every facility is a little bit different if you're again in an outpatient or ambulatory type of setting you might not have somebody at your disposable 24 seven. You do need to know who you turn to in the event of, of an emergency, especially an environmental emergency. So from one of my past lives here, we have, if it's after hours, contact facilities on call. If you have no answer from that person, again, at a small place, people might be on vacation. You have to contact the administrator on call. Again, refer to your own specific policies and procedures if you have them. Facilities needs to notify infection prevention, life safety, and if they hadn't yet been notified, the administrator on call of any water intrusion for any and all moderate or major events. <clears throat> and we define moderate and major events as water intrusions that has spread beyond the room of origin, affecting multiple areas. And then facilities should determine the need to employ an emergency remediation company. Uh, many of these are available throughout the United States. I won't name any specific businesses, but restoration, emergency restoration. If your facilities director cannot tell you after you're done watching this video and you call them or email them and say, hey, what's your plan if we have a flood and they don't have an immediate response, they need to create a contract or develop a relationship with one of these emergency remediation companies. And if possible, take photos for documentation purposes. These might come in handy for any insurance claims that will happen later on down the road. Assessment of potential impact organizations. We're going to move into the next sections. Department leaders on site are going to assess the situation for potential compromised patient care and system operations potential staffing needs to manage damage and patient flow. <clears throat> and I think a really good tip that I believe I added on to this checklist from the original format is not to forget in, in a water intrusion event, especially if it's not on the first floor or the basement, that we need to check rooms below and adjacent to where the water damage actually occurred. If we don't identify all of the areas impacted, we could be at risk for mold growth days later. <clears throat> Excuse me. Next, we're going to be looking at implementation of the emergency response plan. 
So here we have engineering facilities in consultation with life safety, infection prevention, nursing administration supervisor, whoever the case may be, um, and this administrator on call. Again, it's different at every facility, so I tailor this to your own needs. They will determine the level of emergency response needed based on the severity of the intrusion and the impact on the organization. It's gonna be very different if you have flooding in your operating room or your sterile supply room than it is in a random housekeeping or janitorial closet in the basement. Those two things are very different in how they might impact the organization, right? Something we often forget to do in the face of an emergency because we're running around, especially water intrusions, is to initiate our hospital's incident command system if need be. Um, that is an administrator decision to perform. But when we initiate our emergency operations or incident command system, <clears throat> we generally get more resources from the entire facility to help us navigate this very serious issue. <clears throat> Excuse me. Next, we wanna evaluate the scope of the water intrusion. This is really neat and I really appreciated that the checklist that I found online from MultiCare Health System separated out the different categories of water. So if you're a new infection preventionist, interestingly, I think a lot of times our facilities or maintenance partners might say, oh, it's clean water. Don't worry. It came from the coffee water line or it came from the toilet tank, not the bowl. Well, I would argue that in a healthcare facility, very rarely would we truly have a clean water intrusion. Usually if it's going through ceilings or coming up through floor drains, that's not going to be clean water. Rainwater is not uh, clean water either, FYI. So we categorize though where the water came from. And there could be times when clean water hasn't really spread too far. But this is potable water from a broken pipe, clean sink overflow, or appliances where we can potentially dry and save the carpet, pad, and wallboard. If it's truly clean water, we can attempt to do those salvaging steps. The next category is gray water, category two. Any toilet water from above the trap without feces, sprinkler system activation or leaks, roof leaks, groundwater leaks, washing machine overflow discharge or dishwater wastewater, dishwasher wastewater, that's a tongue twister. In these instances, it is not recommended to attempt to try um, and dry out wallboard or carpet in healthcare settings. And I will say this does happen a lot. At the end of the checklist, I'm gonna actually show you some pictures that I've taken through my own personal experiences of water intrusion. As we know, mother nature makes no excuses for healthcare facilities, unfortunately. The last category is the most severe category, black water, category three. And this is really where we're talking about toilet overflow from beyond the trap, regardless of what content or color is there, we consider it all black water. <clears throat> Any sewer backups, seawater, saltwater aquariums, clean or gray water losses that sat wet and unmitigated for an extended period of time. This is really important. If you had a flood on a Friday and the place closed, and nobody identified it, and there was a holiday on Monday, for example, this happens more than we like to think. And on Tuesday morning, everybody comes into the ambulatory surgical center and we have, we have water damage. That's been an extended period. And your facility needs to determine what they're comfortable with. Generally, anything contaminated with black water must be removed and discarded if it can't be truly reprocessed in the proper way. Moving into remediation, <clears throat> this depends on the amount, type, and location of the intrusion. Again, I appreciate this about the existing checklist from multi-center, is that what it is? Multi-care health system. We're gonna look at remediation steps for each category of the type of water. So whether it's clean, gray, or black water, what do we do and how do we handle that? <clears throat> Again, this is really helpful if you work with your facilities team and you ask them, what do we do in the event of a water intrusion? And they really don't have a solid plan in place. This is what you can actually start using to prepare now instead of in the moment, which is very challenging. 
So for category one clean water, of course, first step common sense, you have to remove the water before it keeps causing more and more damage. You're going to be using wet vacs, absorbent materials, things called pig mats. Sometimes you might only have blankets and linens that are around. You're basically just really trying to get the water up and stop, of course, where it's coming from, as we mentioned above. <clears throat> Next, we need to identify what surfaces and materials have been affected. Obviously, engage housekeeping for proper cleaning and disinfection. And to this point, you need to be using your hospital approved. EPA registered disinfectants for any of these categories. And we will talk about in Blackwater, you, we may be needing a sporicidal solution uh, depending on the type of water, uh, category one, two, or three. This is important, especially in practices that in facilities that contract their housekeeping or environmental services. It's really important that we make sure that they're using EPA registered products in my experience, the contracted companies may not be using the same EPA approved products that we use in the healthcare environment. So double check that. <clears throat> Set containment barriers as indicated to, pro to prevent cross-contamination to non-affected areas. This is a great idea. We don't wanna keep dragging dirty equipment from the contaminated area into a clean area that has not been affected. I have worked in the past in places that were not prepared to handle water damage. Facilities needs to have the tools in their toolbox, metaphorically speaking and literally speaking, to be able to handle this to any type of water intrusion. So <clears throat> we've set up our barriers. Whether or not facilities has the capacity to do this or they will be hiring a professional company to help with removal of baseboards, ceiling tiles. Does your facility even have dehumidifiers to help dry out the air? You need to pull the moisture from the air and remove it altogether and make sure that your dehumidifiers have a proper place to drain because they're going to fill with water themselves. And the last thing you want is for your dehumidifier to overflow <clears throat> and recontaminate what you've been cleaning. Generally, in infection prevention and control, we frown upon the use of fans and anything that moves the air, um, agitates the air in a strong manner. However, when you have water damage, you really do need to start air movement to dry it out. Again, if your facilities team is not experienced in this, you need to hire a professional company. Again, setting up containment barriers to reduce the size of the drying chamber might help faster drying. Once we have the water removed and we begin cleaning and disinfection, we really need to dry everything out. For facilities, they need to remove any carpeting, wallboard, including drywall, and any other items that can't be dried to less than 20% moisture within 48 to 72 hours. This is a general guidance and your team might determine a different percentage. Standard devices should be used to measure moisture levels. Do you have a moisture meter? I'm gonna show you a picture one when we're done with the checklist. I think it's a great idea to use the same device for every measurement that you're going to perform, again, to have consistent report outs. If you use a different meter and keep measuring different spots, you could get inconsistency. And you really wanna make sure that these building materials are thoroughly dried. <clears throat> and sorry for all my throat clearing. I've been talking a lot today and I clearly need more tea. So part of this facility's response is I have indicated here uh, something else that I had added on to this original checklist, documenting your initial moisture meter readings if facilities is handling this themselves. If a professional company is helping you, you should have access and reports to all of the moisture meter readings that they take. That's, that's another important step. <clears throat> so you're not only taking the meter when, after you've gotten that initial cleanup, but you do wanna recheck that in 48 to 72 hours. If it's still above that threshold and it's wet, you're gonna be, be needing to move into more severe remediation steps. Oh, probably a lot of drywall removal, more than just drying it out, because of course you can't risk having any mold or fungus grow 
in your facilities. Any item that doesn't meet dry requirements within the time frame is going to be removed at least 12 inches above the water line. So if you have flooding on the main floor and that drywall is still wet, the facilities or professional company is going to mark 12 inches from that last wet point, and they're going to be cutting all of that out and replacing it. I have some pictures too for that. <clears throat> for gray water, again, we need that bulk water removal using wet vacs, absorbent materials. <clears throat> now we're moving into gray and black water. We really need to be thinking about PPE. Um, in the first step, when we're talking about using cleaning and disinfectants, of course, we would expect our workers to be using PPE per the disinfectant recommendations as well. All of this is standard precautions. So PPE re recommended gloves at a minimum, again, depending on what big of a mess you're working on and if it's gray or black water, you may need uh, more PPE. Setting your containment barriers to prevent cross-contamination. Looks like I have a little spelling error here. Um, identify and remove non-restorable affected building materials. So carpeting, drywall, all of these things that we really can't clean and disinfect. And if they're not being dried out, we have to think about removing them. Again, wet wallboard will be removed at least 12 inches above the water line if it hasn't dried. Actually, this is whether or not it's dried because it's gray water. Our last category, category three black water is the most severe. And we're using full PPE gloves, glo gloves, gown, maybe a jumpsuit, a Tyvek bunny suit that's disposable, mask, eye protection if indicated. And sometimes a respirator might be necessary. And really, if we're getting into this level, hopefully you've hired a professional remediation and restoration company because this would probably be a pretty big mess. Of course, we need bulk water removal, containment again. This is where with black water, we're going to be looking at HEPA filters with negative air pressure to protect our surrounding or adjacent healthcare areas. Identifying removing all wet porous materials, all the wet wallboard is going to have to be removed. And again, that will be up 12 inches um, from the water line. We have to remove all of that. <clears throat> Clean, sanitize, and disinfect. It should say disinfect there. Um, infection prevention will provide consultation. That's where we come in and why this is an infection prevention issue. Um, it's clearly an infection prevention issue for multiple reasons, but we really want to be sure that we're using the correct disinfectants. In this type of scenario, I would be looking definitely for a sporocidal disinfectant uh, that has a C. difficile claim, for example. You can find those on the EPA list K. And you can always contact me if you don't know what I'm talking about with the APA, EPA lists. This is really where it's important that you should have third-party testing or evaluation come in and check that the area is safe before you have patients return to that environment. From a reporting perspective, we want to make sure that the department supervisor or manager does, does complete an incident or safety report. And I think what I'm going to do is switch screens and just show you some pictures of areas that have received water damage that I've come across in my career. We'll just go through some photos and discuss this briefly and hopefully keep this video pretty short. <clears throat> so this is interesting. This is a windowsill. And if we look really close, let's see if I can zoom. The water damage is evident right here. You can see the, the building material on the ledge pulling away. And this is a window ledge that experienced significant water damage. And so that is a great visual. Maybe I can zoom in a little bit more. This is where I'm looking right here where the, the ply board, if that's the correct term. Sorry if you're in construction and I'm not using the correct term. But basically, you see peeling. And you also see the building materials waving, um, basically indicating that they've been damaged by water. Let's see what my next picture is. I forget what order these are in. So hopefully this will click. Okay. 
<clears throat> this is a little harder to see. I'm going to try to zoom in. And I would never share um, the facility names, but that really isn't the point because water damage can happen anywhere. And it has nothing to do with any of the protective layers that we have in place. Unfortunately, water finds a way in. So here, it's hard to see, but there is discoloration in the carpet. And that's usually a good indicator that a place has, has experienced water damage. And it is concerning when you have carpet, because as a reminder, we can't disinfect carpet. The best we could do is sanitize it. I have big concerns when we have gray or black water and it hasn't been properly extracted because we know that there can be mildew, mold growth underneath that, especially if there's padding. So something to be looking for when you're on environmental care rounds is evidence you might see a dried ring um, and you know that that, that, that facility or that area has experienced water damage. Um, this was a fun time. Uh, this is a procedure room for radiology. <clears throat> and you can see here, you can see the water. This hadn't yet been cleaned up. Um, this is groundwater. I'm not wearing booties, but I did have gloves on, I promise. But it had seeped in from the outside through the wall, interestingly. Um, and I just was taking pictures for documentation that silt had kind of uh, leached through. And again, now this is this is not great. But someone had had taped this molding back to the wall, which obviously isn't going to do much and is not not even a temporary solution, let alone a permanent solution. Um, however, they were trying to keep it assumedly from falling down. Uh, but you can see here, uh, clearly the wall is beginning to warp and that the molding has come away and that there's issues with the, the paint and the drywall. This is a perfect example that's something that would have to, if it's not dried out right away, is going to have to be um, cut out and replaced, dependent on, on how long this has been sitting there. Uh, fortunately, we didn't lose a ton of equipment in this, in this water intrusion. I had mentioned previously that on carpet, you can tend to see that ring from water intrusions. And this is a great example where you can see how far the water um, leached out. It's, it's really hard to extract all of the water properly to ensure that it is not going to encourage mold growth. Carpet for me is a no-no in healthcare. And whenever I do infection control risk assessments for construction, I really do try to find any other alternative to carpeting. And fortunately, we have a lot of flooring substrate options today in, in 2023. This is an example of a moisture meter. In case you've never seen one, I bought my own on Amazon because I am that weird in OCD as an infection preventionist. Here you can see obvious signs of water damage. The paint is bubbling because the water came in from the ceiling and went down the beams. Water, water will flow along the beams as well. And so um, obviously the drywall was also impacted here. And when I use my moisture meter, Dr. Meter, it's at 100% humidity at the point at the time the water first started. And so then that would be my initial measurement and I would be checking throughout the remediation process. Unfortunately, this was in our operating room sterile supply area, which is a total disaster. So we had covered as much as we could in getting this clean. Again, the whole point is to we had to move everything out of that room as soon as possible to ensure that nothing else would be damaged. Um, anything, again, you have to look at your surgical sterile instrument policies to determine what you're doing if any humidity or temperature is out of range. Um, that's a different discussion. And again, you have to follow your policies and procedures. Anything that, of course, the packaging looked like it had been touched by any type of water, obviously that's going to need to be reprocessed. This is an example of having to cut this. 
there were no ceiling tiles. This was the straight ceiling. And we had to cut into the ceiling after removing all that equipment and putting up our barriers, ensuring we were in negative pressure with a pressure with a HEPA filter. Um, and this was where the water was coming actually from the roof. And so it was coming right through the roof, through the drywall. I chose to share this picture because this is also evidence that that moisture or water has impacted an area. Um, interestingly, I noticed this on the ceiling and all of this bubbling means that moisture had happened at some point. It might not even be active. Um, in fact, I touched this and, and the plaster, actually I, I created a hole in the plaster. Um, that just needs to be uh, repaired, remediated and repaired with of course the infection prevention control risk assessment, construction risk assessment, if any of this type of work is being performed in our healthcare facilities. Remember, it doesn't matter if the construction is happening in a patient care area or not, there are still areas that don't have patients directly in them that still need all of the same safety precautions to protect everybody in the environment. This is another facility I worked at where we actually had a massive pipe burst and it flooded all of the resident physician quarters. So we had quite a bit of water in a humongously long hallway. Uh, very extensive damage you can see here. And I share this too because as we were remediating, we actually saw signs of, um, of discoloration. We'll call it discoloration. You don't need to we don't need to identify necessarily at all steps. Um, sometimes just knowing that there's discoloration. Uh, this happened right on the same day of the flood. And so probably what happened is that there had been water damage in that wall sometime before because these pictures were taken the same day the flood actually happened. Um, so you can see here, um, sometimes to dry the drywall out, they will bore holes at the baseboards to really allow the dehumidifiers and fans to work. And so uh, the, the wallpaper has been cut and removed. Um, this will be tossed away and hopefully facilities has matching wallpaper um, to re wallpaper this. Uh, or maybe we never re wallpaper anything again. I hate, I hate wallpaper. I would way rather have something painted, but I know that's not our reality all the time. This is another example of when you have a water intrusion and a professional remediation company might come in and bore those holes in baseboards. And here you can see they're trying to salvage because they caught it right away. Within like two hours, they're pulling up the wallpaper and they're going to try to salvage that by drying this out. Um, if they're not successful, of course, this is going to have to be removed and renovated. Again, I don't like wallpaper, I don't like carpet. Both of them have a glue and that glue can be yummy, yummy food for bacteria and all sorts of other gross stuff. For me, I like simplicity. Simplicity helps prevent the spread of infections when it comes to building materials. And so that is uh, the end of this presentation and education on my YouTube channel. I'm sorry, it's taken me a while to record new content. I will put my contact information in the comments below. I thank you for all the people who have followed me from my initial risk assessment video. And remember, if, you're in fact, if you are an infection preventionist and you're all by yourself and you need to phone a friend and you feel like you're not really connected to your local APIC chapter yet, you have my contact information in the comments. You can always shoot me an email and I will be happy to help you out if I can. And if I don't know the answer to your question, I usually have a pretty good idea of who you could turn to to help you out. So have a great day and thank you for watching this water intrusion checklist video.